So I'm not your shrink. I don't know anything a, about you. I can't help you in any way. Uh, it's been a weird few months, man. So I will just jump right into it. Uh, probably two months ago now, we had a, I don't want to say it was like a no nothing cardiac arrest. Cause like they're for that family and all that, that is obviously a very serious thing, but we go on so many that they stop losing their impact unless there is something that Desensitized. is Desensitized. Like, all right. Great yeah. word. Desensitized. Is, yeah. Cause unless there's something that is like, which uh, is, there's rare. a, there's a good thing to that. Uh, I think being a paramedic going on cores and stuff, if you're desensitized, because if you don't get emotionally involved, you just, you're task oriented. Like this is what needs to get done. Yeah. You know, because if you get emotionally involved, it's going to affect your your care, decision making, you're going to get more stressed, you know? I mean, it's the, when we go on those kid calls, right? right? We have a, we need a pediatric. Those get tough. They are tougher, but even then, you know, like, but it goes to your point, right? When you get emotionally invested, things get tough. Right. So the next morning, um, I just kind of felt like I was in a funk. And since 2015, I've been doing therapy. And so 20, uh, November 17th, 2015 was the Planned Parenthood shooting uh, down in Colorado Springs where I was a SWAT medic. And we, it was the, uh, to be honest with you, it was the reason why I became a part of the standard is because you guys had me on as a guest. And so if you want to listen to that one, you can, but basically we had 12 people shot, three killed. Most of those shot were police officers who we were working with. And it, uh, it totally messed me up, man. I went home that next day and my family was still out of town and dude, I found the bottom of that bottle and then I found a bottom of another one. It just, that's how I was dealing with stuff. And I went to work shortly after that. And my lieutenant at the time was like, hey, you have an appointment with EAP, you're going. Like, thank God that dude did that. Just a a solid human being and a really good officer. So uh, I'm on duty and I go to this, my first therapy appointment. I've never been to therapy before. And this lady, we talk about, it's exactly what I thought therapy was going to be, right? Sit down on a couch. She's like, tell me what's going on. I tell her what's going on. And, She's uh, like, oh, yeah. What is this? Well, she, uh, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. She, she had no ability to have any sort of competence when it comes to what we do. And I think she was trying to do her best, but she gave me a coloring book to help me deal with this, these issues that I was having. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, no cultural competence at all whatsoever. Right. I was just like, well, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. So I left there feeling worse because I was like, oh, there is no, like, I will not get better, right? So I was having a hard time sleeping, drinking a lot. World kind of felt just kind of numb. And I was mad all the time, like clearly depressed, right? So um, things got worse and I ended up finding a therapist that, uh, that I really liked. When you're when people are like, I'm, Hey, I'm going to go to therapy. It's not a one size fits all, right? It's not like you're trying to find a one night stand, right? You're trying to find like a, a, you're going to have an intimate relationship with this person. And so you might have to go through four or five people to find that. And I found that. And after going through a couple sessions, I did some EMDR stuff and that's, that helped me. I was good. Right. So every time I started to feel myself kind of go down that route, I'd go back to a therapist. We'd knock it out and I was good to go. Right. It was like these little, you know, um, little bumps to get me back to where I needed to be. So that's what I thought happened. Right. I was like, hey, uh, for whatever reason, this call messed me up. I need to go see somebody. So I followed our department's procedures. And I went to go see who the department offered, which is awesome that our department does that. And I'm sitting down and I'm talking with this guy and he's like, yeah, we want to put you on some antidepressants. This was two months ago. And I'm like, not me. (laughs) No way. It just sounded like, like so defeating that am I, am I that bad off that I need to be put on SSRIs? And this gentleman thought so. So I left that meeting and I was just like 
felt broken, dude. Like not only do I feel like that isn't going to fix the problem, but I had this horrible imposter syndrome of, dude, you have a podcast called the standard and people go to you for advice and you're going to be walking around on these medications. And if you're on those meds and they work for you, by all means, like that's awesome. But those medications have a 25% chance of giving you some relief and a 0% chance of you, good. you getting off of them, yeah, right? Recidivism. All right. So not great. So I, uh, I didn't know what to do, man. And I just kept feeling like, you know, when you do a stand up 24, like you don't sleep for 24 hours, you're just running calls all night. That next morning when you feel just kind of like everything's slower, you feel numb, things don't taste very good. Things will set you off in like a second. Oh yeah. All right. So I was like that for about a month Mm. and it all kind of came to a head. I was taking my daughter and son to the zoo one day and me and my daughter, my son is running around like a, like a two year old should and a three year old. And, uh, I'm holding my daughter's hand and we're walking by the elephants and the elephants is where we go. And we always have our lunch and it's always like this awesome time to hang out. And I'm holding my daughter's hand and I feel nothing. I don't feel joy. I don't feel sadness. I just feel numb. And I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, my brain's broken. Like, how do, how do I do this, right? No amount of cold plunges or getting sun in your eyes the first 30 minutes. Like, none of that stuff matters, right, at this point. And so, normally, I will go for a run as my way to, like, decompress and, like, get back to neutral. Okay? But I didn't even want to do that. I just wanted to sit there. And so, I get home from that experience and I can't get out of my truck. I physically can't get out of my truck. Like my body is basically being like, all right, or my mind's like, all right, it's time to go. And my body is just stuck. And so my wife comes out and she's like, what's going on? And I'm like, I need you to get the kids inside. And she's like, okay. She gets the kids inside. 20 minutes later, comes back out. She's like, I'm like, I can't move. And I've had anxiety attacks in the past right? We've all seen them hyperventilating, carpal pedal spasms, right? And I've never had a panic attack before, which is what I have come to known as this. So everything that I'm going to say in this podcast is what I've learned over the last couple of months. So if you guys have different information or you guys think that I'm wrong, please reach out and tell me because from the doctors who I've talked to and the research I've done, this is what I've come up with. So I'll lay that out there. I am not an expert in this by any means. I have no degrees in any of this stuff. It is just, it was the craziest few months and I've done some deep dives into this stuff. So I'm totally screwed, right? And my wife's like, should I call an ambulance? And I was like, absolutely not. I know how this goes, right? Like this is not, that's not what I need. So I uh, texted Rhonda Kelly, um, who's been on the show and, um, she runs this absolutely incredible outfit and for first responders, first responders. Yep. yep. And, um, I text her and I text her, Hey, this is what's going on. And she sends me, uh, the phone number of this gentleman who works at a company called mind spa here in Denver. And I've never met this dude. Don't know anything about him, but if she tells me to call this guy, I'm gonna call this guy. So I call him and I think Rhonda gave him a bit of a heads up. And uh, I'm like, hey, man, like, I'm stuck in my truck. Like, I was having some suicidal thoughts uh, prior to that. And so, like, all that stuff started to, like, kind of come back. And um, which is not on my brand at all. Like, if, like, that has not been a part of my thing. But I just, I was, I felt like I was so messed up for that month. I was like, well, let's just get this over with. Like, I didn't want to go to work anymore. I felt like I was being a bad father and like setting my kids up for failure with the way I was acting and yelling at him all the time. And I was not being a good spouse and, um, like couldn't sleep. So I was miserable in the mornings cause I was, and I didn't want to go to bed cause all I was doing was having nightmares. So like it was this nasty cycle for a while. So I call this dude and, uh, he picks the phone he goes, how we doing, man? I'm like, I'm not good. 
and I start crying to a stranger, right? Anyone who knows me knows that like, that is, I do not, that is not how I cope. I do not shed tears. And I just start crying. And he's like, you basically, you're like, your brain is swollen with chemicals that are making you feel stuck and un- incapable of moving. And I'll, I'll get into why that is the way that it is, but I'll, I'll finish this part of the story. So he's like, you need to move, okay? And so um, he's like, you need to flush, basically flush this stuff out of your system. I'm like, okay, I can do that, right? You've given me a tangible problem and a tangible solution. So probably took me 10 minutes to get out of my truck and to get upstairs. And I couldn't like move my hands. So now I'm like 20 minutes to put my shorts on. My wife had to help me. And I get to the edge of my driveway finally, and, um, like she had to fill up my water bottles for like just everything. I just, I couldn't move and I get to the edge of the driveway and I stop again and I'm like, give me a step, dude. Like then my brain is telling my body to like, just give me a step, one step. And eventually I got across the street and it was like, all right, we got across the street. Let's go, let's go a little more. And you know, I read, I ran a hundred miles in Leadville. I would rather do that 10 times than do this, what I'm, what I'm doing right now. And then I start to walk. Then I start to jog a little bit. And then I have a total breakdown of like, what happened to you, man? Like you were supposed to be this like dialed in person who, you know, ultra marathoner, Iron Man's like you got your own podcast, like all this stuff that you think makes you who you are, and now you can't even move. Like you suck is basically what I was thinking in my own mind, right? And then it was like catastrophizing of all right, now you can't be a fireman anymore. What are you gonna do? Right? Now you're just like this broken human. And so uh I finish out the run and I come back and I I call this guy again and I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I did it. I'm feeling a little bit better, but like now what do I do? And so mind spa specializes in, um, ketamine treatments among some other things, but that's what I was going to go there for. They're like our next appointments in a month. And I'm like, I'm not going to make it a month. Like I barely made it through today. Right. That's where I was mentally. And I didn't come up with a plan of how I was you know, going to do it, but like I wanted to just end it. And so he's like, I can get you in in nine days. I'm like, all right, I can do nine days. So in that nine days, I spent time um, studying what ketamine does and then what the hell just happened to me. Like, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, dude, this feeling. And so basically, we feel like our brains are controlling the way that we move through the world, okay? But it's really our central nervous system. So if you can imagine an elephant with a little tiny jockey on top, right? Our brain's the jockey. We think we're in control, okay? But 80% of, of how we're moving through the world is, has nothing to do with our brain at all. It's our central nervous system taking in experiences and then giving out chemicals to help us deal with that, right? So the way that I was thinking for that last month was basically like through a concrete tube, Okay. So every experience that I had, I was stuck in this fight and flight. All right. And so what ketamine does is basically breaks that apart so that you can have these other experiences in your life. Okay. But I was stuck because your central nervous system is your sympathetic, which is basically dumping chemicals into your body to allow you to fight. Then you have your parasympathetic which is the opposing force of that. And that is broken down into uh, dorsal and ventral, all right? So ventral is right now, right? Super comfortable, feel really safe. I know safe is such like a silly word to say now because it's kind of been bastardized to be like, oh, you need to be safe, oh. But I mean, pick whatever word you want, comfortable, you know, like sitting on your couch, Watching TV, like that's ventral, all right? Your body is not in these two extremes, okay? Dorsal is your body will send out 
chemicals to shut certain parts of your body down, right? So if you're fighting, your body doesn't need your digestion. It doesn't need reproduction. And so your body basically says, hey, we're going we're gonna to send some, some chemicals to shut that down because we don't need it right now. We need uh, all of our, you know, cortisol. Respiratory. And, yeah, all yeah. that, right? We need, we need to bump that up. So when I felt stuck and couldn't move, that's because my body was shutting all that stuff down chemically. So it's not that my brain was broken or that I was like a bad person or a bad fireman, but that's just what our brain's trying to be, come up with a reason for this happening. It's just that my brain was basically like dumping these chemicals that I didn't need in places that I shouldn't have been. And so I was stuck in a dorsal state. And this is all part of this polyvagal theory. Basically, from here on out, everything that I'm going to talk about. So the key is not to live in ventral. The key is not to live in this like, oh, everything's good. and Because we need to have moments of fighting. We need to have moments of that dorsal where we need to shut some stuff down, right? We need all that stuff. So the key to polyvagal theory is basically how can I move through those three states throughout the day? Okay. Uh, a really easy way, if you've never felt anything like this, to feel what dorsal feels like is, let's say that you're kind of an introvert and you're walking into a party or something like that. You don't really know anybody and you kind of feel like guarded and I don't want to be here. I can't really think clearly. If someone asks me a question, like, am I going to say something stupid? Like that's a, that's your dorsal. Right. I just had a very extreme version of that for an extended period of time. And so another thing that happens is that uh, it's called Hebb's Law. It's basically the neural synapses that we use consistently get, let's call it stronger. All right. And the ones that we don't use basically kind of like die off. All right. So when I say that I was experiencing life through a concrete tunnel, I was experiencing life through the neurons that were still working the synapses that were still working, right? So if I'm stuck in this fight and flight dorsal mode, every experience that comes in, it's only coming through those synapses that are firing with all that stuff. When I have lost the capability of feeling joy, those are just dead. I can't expect them to work. So the three components that basically run our synapses are serotonin, which is why people use SSRIs as antidepressants, GABA and glutamate, all right? Serotonin runs 2% of our synapses. That's it. So the reason why those antidepressants don't work super effectively is because you're only affecting a small portion of what we need to basically like get back to neutral. And so what ketamine does is in, and I'm saying this, as the doses that I took it in, the protocol that I followed, the place that I went to, this is how this works. This is not, if you take ketamine recreationally, it probably won't have the same effect, okay? It's like the precursor. It basically like turns on your body's ability to make glutamate and beta. When we break that tube apart with ketamine, it basically like turns those other neural synapses back on. That's how this whole thing works. I'll kind of tell you my ketamine story, but... I want to impress on the fact that like, it's not a, hey, you do this and you're smooth for the rest of your life, right? Now I've had to learn how to live my life so that I can move through these three different states of being throughout the day. So if I start to feel myself getting more dorsal, then I need to figure out a way to get back to ventral and fast, right? I don't want to be stuck in there. I know how miserable that is. We can talk about kind of how to do that later. But the ketamine protocol that I followed, and there's a ton of different ways out there to do it, was six sessions, two days apart. And they gradually increase the dosage of your ketamine after each session. And the way that Mind Spa does it is you'll be in a room by yourself. There's a nurse there who's constantly taking vital signs and monitoring you. And they had put on some heads or uh, headphones and uh, you're watching kind of like these nature escapes, right? Pretty mellow, safe environment. What's different about ketamine and like, let's say psilocybin, which is a pretty popular 
right now and people are like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm bummed out. So I'm going to do some mushrooms and I'll feel better. Like you are not, you are messing with stuff that can alter your brain. So all of those things need to be done with some sort of protocol in place. All right. There's a book I read called Consciousness Medicine. And I'll put links to everything that I've used and listened to in the show notes so that everyone has access to it. But it basically walks you through the history of psychedelic use and its ability for healing trauma. It's what the book's about, how to prepare for it, what a journey should look like, all these things. But those psychedelics are external experiences. So the experience is what heals you. Ketamine is a medicine and it really doesn't matter what your experience is because the key is to turn those neurons back on. Now, I had some incredible experiences in those six sessions and I had other ones that like shook me to my core and made me physically ill for hours and hours after the the injection. The other reason why I think it's important and this is my own personal opinion to do ketamine this way is like, let's say that you take a, a I am shot of whatever drug, right? You can't uncork that or you eat a, you eat a bag of mushrooms. You are on that trip until it's over. All right. With a ketamine infusion, you're on a drip. And if something goes sideways, they can stop the drip and your experience is over relatively quickly for the most part. So to me, that was the way that I wanted to do it. And I had known some people who went through this process before me and they had great outcomes and they're like, Hey, you got to go to this place. So I've, I felt pretty comfortable with that. I get into this office and, uh, I'm like, I'm here to see Sam, who's the gentleman that I talked to on the phone. Cause I thought he was the doctor. They had kind of a confused look on their face and I'm like, Oh no. Like I've been looking forward to this day for every second for the last nine days. And uh, did I mess something up? So he's like, if you want to have a seat, Sam's in a meeting. And I'm like, in a meeting? Like, I have an appointment in five minutes. Sam comes out, mountain of a man. And uh, he's like, what, uh, what's up, bud? And I'm like, hey, I'm Craig. And we did the hug. And he's like, how you doing? All this other sort of stuff. And he's like, what, uh, what are you doing here? And I'm like, uh, I'm here to see you. And he's like, oh, no, like, I'm just the finance guy. Like, you're actually here to see Dr. French. <laughs> and so this dude completely changed my life. And he was just like the finance guy who worked there. It was awesome. Oh, man, I'm not even a doctor. I just stayed at holiday. <laughs> I stayed at holiday. Yeah. That's what I said. <laughs> like, fuck. I go in to have this meeting with Dr. French, and I learn more about what was happening more in that hour than I have in the last, you know, almost 10 years of going to therapy. It was incredible. And so, you know, ketamine's not for everybody, right? There are some things that could be going on in your life where ketamine's not the first option. But he's like, hey, I think you're, you're going to be good to go. And I had written, I've been doing journaling since my time in the, in the truck. I got up and part of what I wanted to do was get my thoughts down on paper, what was happening. And so, and you can see it and we've created a class for this and I'll show this in the class, but it's basically like one line sentences. That's all I could get out. And then after my run, I was able to get like a few sentences out of what was happening. And so I, I read that stuff to, um, Dr. French and I was just like a shell of myself, dude. I had even talked to my crew about this cause I was going to work during this time. And I was like, Hey guys, just to let you know, like, here's where I'm at. Like, I'm not okay. And you know, I don't know what to do. Basically what I told them. And the, dude, our guys are just, they're the best, they're the fucking best, man. Like they picked up my slack. No questions asked. It was awesome. So I'm sitting in there and Dr. French is like, you're going to be fine. Like, I promise you, you're going to be fine. So I go into the other room and I meet the nurse And she basically kind of tells me what's going to go down. And she's like, I've kind of created these playlists and, uh, ketamine, ketamine seems to be activated by music for some reason. Like as the music changed, my experience changed. It was like, you're living in a soundtrack. It was nuts. 
So she starts an IV, takes my vital signs, starts an IV, and I'm just like ready for whatever, man. Like I'm at that point of just like, whatever this is, dude, I don't care. Cause then it ain't going to get any worse. You kind of feel, and again, everyone, this is just my experience, um, for, for all this stuff, you kind of feel a little drunk in the first few minutes. And then a song changed and it felt like I went to another dimension and in my head, cause it, Mushrooms is like an external experience where you're seeing things. Ketamine's all inside. So my head, my my voice was like, thank God you made it here. Like, this is where you're supposed to be. We're so happy you made it. And I just felt like this overwhelming sense for the first time in like a month and a half, like pure bliss. And it was incredible. And I was in that for a little bit. The, the sessions last 40 minutes. The infusion lasts 40 minutes, but I felt like I was in there for like two and a half hours. The music changed again. And... This, my voice was like, we need to go, we, we need some, we have some work to do. We're going to go back and we're going to go through all of these pieces of trauma and we're going to thank all those people. And so the, the way that I thought about it was like, imagine, you know, obviously I bench press a lot, you know, that's clear. How, how much? 10, 15 pounds. Not bad, right? Clearly. Two, that's your max. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's my two red max. Um, the way that I felt was like, you're laying underneath a bench and people are just putting plates on, right? And that can either bury you or it can make you strong. And so I went back and I thanked all those people for making me strong. And it was devastating. Like stuff that I thought I'd forgotten about from like 19 years ago in the fire service. After that, I came out and felt like this bliss again. And this like overwhelming sense of gratitude for the life that I have, right? The fact that out of all the people in the world, me and my wife found each other, right? And have this incredible relationship. And then out of all the bad stuff that can happen, we have two healthy, incredible kids. Like all this stuff just started like hammering me, dude. And then I see a picture of in my mind, um, my daughter and she looks very sad. And then I felt like her and I got swallowed by like a monster. And I was like, I thought I was going to die. Like I felt like a sense of like the worst dread and fear you possibly can. And I'm like filling up my headphones with tears and the nurse comes over and she puts her hand on my chest and I felt like a fucking angel was in the room. Like, everything's going to be okay. It was, it was unreal, man. So I came out of that, and it ends fine, and the infusion stops. And you feel, you feel kind of plastered to the seat, right? Ketamine is a disassociative, and, and I basically feel like kind of paralyzed. You can talk if you had to, but it probably sounds like this. <laughs> and so... Uh, a few minutes later, I'm kind of back to normal and I'm telling Emily, the nurse, um, my experience. And I thought she was charting my whatever. She was actually putting it into an artificial intelligence art generator. So now I have these images and I'll show them on the, on the screen of what that, uh, of what that looked like. It's incredible because now after each experience that I had, because I had some ones that were not so great. I have like an image of it. After that, you go into a room and you journal for however long it takes you to feel like comfortable to like walk out into the world again. And then you pick me up. So like what, I don't even know if I've ever asked you, like what was that experience like? I actually didn't even know what to think. Because I mean, going back to, I mean, you even saying this now, you're like, I had what you're telling me, like how you felt at work. You know, you hear those stories of people who do follow through with those thoughts. And then the people that are left behind are like, I had no idea. And I had no idea. Yeah. I, I think I was on a vacation when you told the guys. I yeah. Mean, I, um, during the summer months, spring to summer months, I'm um, less frequently at work just due to baseball season and all that. I had no, I had no idea. And they're like, I'm getting a ketamine treatment. <laughs> I couldn't get out of the car. I remember you telling me I, 
I couldn't move and I'm doing these treatments. And so then I knew about that, but I had no, no idea. We're good at hiding, man. And I think one thing that I learned that was interesting was um, when we feel like that, all we want to do is go back to work, right? Like <clears throat> I didn't want to be a fireman anymore, but I didn't want to be home more. And the reason that we just are like, oh, I just want to get back to work is because it's easy, right? Like the stressors that we have at work are pretty simple, right? We have policies, we have experience and all that other sorts of stuff. It's at home. There's no policy for how to deal with your family when you can't physically handle yourself. So this drive to like, I just, I'm gonna pick up some more overtime shifts or, you know, I just, I need to get back to work and feel comfortable being around the guys who understand what I'm going through, or maybe they don't understand what I'm going through, but they can at least appreciate it. As opposed to your family that's just like, what is wrong? Like, what happened to you? Like, you are a shell of who you're supposed to be. And I remember really vividly having a moment. It was after the zoo. I just like, I break down crying. And my wife has only seen me probably cry like three times in our however many year history together. And it's usually over something point specific, right? So um, we had three pediatric cores that all died in a week. That was one. Uh, Planned Parenthood was another one. And then maybe this was the third. But she's like, hey, go see someone. You get reset and you're good to go. And I remember going upstairs to take a shower because I didn't want my family to hear me cry. And uh, I was like, let's say this was your son, right? Let's say that your son is going through this right now. What would you tell him? Because in my mind, I was like, stop being such a pussy. Like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like punching the side like, like a child, right? I'm having like a tantrum in the shower. And I can't stop crying. And I'm like, what would you tell your son? And I didn't know what to say, which made it worse. Because I'm like, you can't even handle your own, like, you wouldn't even be able to help your son. And afterwards, obviously, I came to the conclusion that I like, I wouldn't say anything, man. I just hold him. Tell him everything's going to be fine. But like, we can't do that to ourselves, right? Like, we, we have a really hard time giving ourselves the love and grace that we would give anybody else, right? Like if you came to me with my problem, I would not talk to you the same way I talk to myself. I would never be like, why are you being such a bitch, right? And that's exactly what I was saying to myself. I think it's hard for a person to tell themselves, though, everything's going to be fine when they're in a – that's why you're in the position you're in because you're feeling of despair. Totally. Right? So someone else having the ability to tell you that, is because they're in a good spot, you know, like they have a good outlook, they're pretty positive, and they're in a state where it's like, it is okay, and um, so it's like, it's, I don't think, I don't think it's abnormal for people to that are going through it to talk to themselves like that, because that, that's why they're there, they're in that feeling of despair, otherwise if they were to, I mean, you would be able to get out of it, we're, Fairly quickly, I think if you were able to tell yourself and you believed it, everything's going to be okay, right? That's what gets us out of. That's we've been in those situations and able to tell ourselves that hey, it's just a stage. Everything will be okay. But that is what I'm talking about with this concrete tube, right? Yeah. Like you can't not think in that's one way. So, but so, I'm, I guess I'm just saying it seems. I don't know if "normal" is the right word, but it seems normal that I, we, we talk to ourselves like that because totally. that's why. We, you know? No, I, I'm with you 100%. Yeah. But if you can get to a spot of like, and I needed to change this a long time ago was my self-talk, right? I was using health, uh, self-hatred as self-criticism. So like if I sucked at something, I, I wouldn't be like, I just would never talk to someone else the way that I talk to myself. I've since been working on changing that. If you are in a spot like that, just try it. Just try and be like, hey, if someone came to you with this problem, what would you tell them? Right? Yeah. Like, take your ego out of the picture for a second, which I think is that 
to, in my eyes, that's what it is, right? I, the, it, what compounded my issues were, was my, the ego I had surrounded around like who I thought people thought I was. And now I'm like letting them down and all this other sort of, the people who really care about me, they could give a fuck less about what I do or any of that. Right. Um, but it's hard in the moment to be able to kind of step outside yourself for a little bit. So if you are in a spot like that, it's an interesting exercise to like, be like, all right, how would Tom, if I came to Tom with this problem, what would he say? Maybe not you. Maybe someone. Come on. Maybe, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, that's the, that's where, you know, I kind of hope we can, we can get as like this community, right? Because we're pretty, this is a pretty tough place to, to have these issues or so I thought. So I go through the rest of my sessions and I won't go through all of them, but some of them were like the first one. And then some of them were just like really bad. Bad as in nothing good came out of them. So I had one where I felt like, uh, I don't know. I felt drunk for 40 minutes and then I was done and I was like, all right, I guess I don't need the rest of these. Thank God I went back. Right. Cause Ketamine, the reason you had, you do so many so fast is that ketamine has this half-life. So after my first one, I think my shift schedule didn't work out. So like I couldn't get there in two days. I was there in like three days or four or something like that. And I totally backslid because that medicine basically like dies off and you need to go back to finish the job. Right. But I was like, well, fuck dude. I've like, I got in your truck and I felt like ready to go back to work. Felt like totally smooth. I got home and I was a great dad and I was like, I was the dad I wanted to be. I got home when you dropped me off and my son was watching TV. I'm like, hey, let's go for a walk. We just took a walk. It was awesome. Like that's, I was like, I'm back. And the next session I went to, it it didn't go like the first one. And I was like, I'll never get that again. Like I, I won't get this breakthrough and all this other sorts of stuff. Or like, is this thing even working anymore? listen to the doctor, follow it through to the end. Since then, I've had five people, I've had more come come to talk to me about this so far in private, which is totally fine. Um, And if anyone's going through this right now and and you want more information or you need someone to jam with, shoot me an email, man. Mail at the-standard.us. I promise I will get back to you. We've, we've sent some other people through this and they've had similar outcomes, positive. And then I've had five people on our job right now who are suicidal. Top performers, not who you think. The reason I feel so passionate about this now is like, I saw the other side. Like I, I see where this can take you and if you don't want to do ketamine, that's fine. If you want to try something else, go for it. But I think what is so important is that you reach out, not just for help, right? I reached out for help and they wanted to put me on antidepressants, right? There is no like quick fix and then you're done. And maybe my fix wasn't your fix, but there is something out there that can help you get through this. And it doesn't matter how much time you have on the job. It doesn't matter if you feel like your call wasn't as bad as someone else's. Like, I feel like we carry this like trauma trophy and whoever's bigger gets to talk instead of like, we have a new guy at our station. That dude could go on a call tonight and it could be the worst thing he's worse ever than seen. Any, well, it could be worse than any call we ever saw. 100%. Yeah. But he doesn't get to say shit because he doesn't have a trophy yet. Right? And so, like, what are we doing? If we want to do what's best for our people in this job, we don't want to make them tough. Right? The job's going to make them tough. Our city's going to make us tough. We want to make them strong. And making people strong is understanding how to move through these sympathetic dorsal and ventral states throughout the day. That is the key. That is what I believe is the key. So you don't get to that point where 
your only synapses that are firing in your brain are stress. That is not what we want, right? So what's screwing that up? Sleep. I was just going to... Okay. It's funny. I was going to ask you, how much does sleep contribute to that? Huge, right? And I tracked all this while I was going through my stuff. So you need all three stages. It's not just REM. Imagine like throughout the day, these little clumps of clay are just getting tossed around in your brain. Okay. Deep sleep gathers all that up and puts it into like a workable ball. And then REM is what comes by and carves out a picture right? Gets rid of the stuff we don't need, keeps the stuff that is important. That's what REM does. When we're getting, so during this time, I was getting roughly like 20 to 30 minutes of REM a night, if I was lucky. So I had all this junk in my brain. It's not like it just like resets magically every day. It just keeps getting dumped in there. And eventually it's like, what do we do with all this stuff? right? Like I don't, I'm not giving myself enough time to clean out my brain. And that's a huge problem, right? Drinking. Thank God I quit drinking five months prior to this starting because I probably would have drank myself to death. When, when you stop drinking, let's say that you have one to two drinks a week, all right? Your body is dumping cortisol in, in your system, even when you're not drinking, right? It's so, so even though you're only having just like, oh, I just have a few drinks a week. When you're not, those off days that you're having, or, or hey, I just go out and I have like four or five drinks on the weekends, your body's dumping cortisol all week long. So it's like, we're not doing ourselves any favor there, right? Obviously being overweight and not, having any sort of fitness in your life, like you have no outlet. Yeah. When you do want to get up and do something, you can't, it's very difficult. Listen, I was 70 pounds heavier than I am now. Everything sucked. I was, I breathed heavy, putting my shoes on. And so like, that's not a, like that is part of the problem too. So when I say things like, I don't give a shit about PFAS, this is why, because we have way bigger problems than stuff like that. Yeah, sleep and diet and exercise and fitness levels, I think, are huge. Um, way more, way more important. Yeah, if you guys want to tackle a problem, like that's what we need to tackle. I always think too, like, you know, how much? It's got to be some sort of PFAS and hats we wear, right? Talk it's about in around your everything, head. Everything, dude. You're it's sweat. In everything. I've played sports for you know twenty years and in, in the Arizona heat and I'm sweating my balls off like well, I what like I do when I'm in bunker gear and all the these first generation of astroturf dude was killing people right so like I'm not saying that stuff isn't important but this there's more important, important. stuff that I think are 100 percent like proven already at this yeah. point that they're problems but we're not we don't want to acknowledge it so let's go back to how we can move through these different states. All right. Um, and again, everybody, <laughs> I'm going to send links out to these other podcasts that do a way better job of describing this from actual doctors. But this is what has been working for me. First of all, you need to fix this big problem, right? So therapy is like a top down approach to mental health ketamine and the psychedelics they're doing awesome stuff with like mdma again with doctors not going out on colfax and getting bags of this stuff and being like oh they said it would help me uh not how you do it that is a bottom-up approach so here's how i like to think about it if you go to a high-rise fire therapy is like you get dropped off on the roof and you're trying to fight the fire from the top ketamine and these other treatments are a bottom-up approach to be able to fight it appropriately, right? Or another one I think about is like, I'm just trying to chop this tree down. Therapy is like you're using a butter knife. Ketamine's like you're using C4. And it's important that you have both. So talk therapy I think is awesome. I think it works better for some people than others. I think it makes you introspective. I think it gives you a language for what's happening to you. But if... That's all you're doing and you're not doing 
any of the other things like digging into this polyvagal theory or you're not doing any breath work or, you know, you're not taking time to journal or whatever you find that piece is that you need, like you have to have that approach too. You can't just, I shouldn't say, I don't think that you can just go to therapy and have a successful, healthy 30-year career. In this polyvagal theory, finding these little micro moments of ventral is important in the beginning. It's important all the time, but it's really important in the beginning. To notice when you're ventral, when you're the way that you want to feel, and you want to anchor yourself to that somehow. So it's usually uh, some sort of breath and some sort of movement that like anchors your body to this moment in time so that when you start to go dorsal, you can anchor yourself back to ventral. And I, I'm telling you this is because it works and I do it all the time. Find what yours are, right? Mine is a simple rub my fingers together and doing a few sighs. And I'll play this video um, of Huberman talking about that. Now you can do physiological size voluntarily anytime you're feeling too stressed and you want to feel more calm. You do it like this. So it's a double inhale and typically the first inhale is longer than the second, but the second one is still important to do. And then a very long extended exhale. Typically both inhales are through the nose and the exhale is through the mouth. That's the most effective way to do the physiological sigh. So if you're feeling stressed in any circumstance, Inhale twice through the nose, and then exhale long through the mouth. If you want, you can repeat it a second or even a third time, but typically just one or two, maybe three physiological sighs are sufficient to bring your level of stress and alertness down very fast and allow you to feel more calm. Here's what I don't like about all this stuff. They put this lame music behind every single one of these like mindfulness, like, oh, we just want to like be in a meadow. Like, <laughs> we don't have time for that. Uh, but... This is the breath work that I do. So I'll rub my fingers together. I'll do three of those. And then I can usually get myself back to that ventral state. And so I catch it early where I'm like, all right, buddy, we're heading down a path we shouldn't go. And it can kind of bring me back. And the breath work stuff's like, we know it works because we see it at work all the time, right? If someone is too acidic, they will breathe in a certain way so their body can rebalance itself, right? Like we see it all the time. And so it's not like this stuff is woo-woo. And a lot of it, a lot of this polyvagal stuff, like if you listen to some of these podcasts, you'd be like, oh, they're wearing Birkenstocks for sure. <laughs> but it works, man. I'm telling you, I, I do it every single day. I'm really happy that this experience happened to me because I know that it's happened to others and they had, they didn't make it out on the other side. And I'm hoping that through this podcast and, you know, if anybody needs to reach out, please feel free. Or if, or if what I've said doesn't make sense, or if what I've said is wrong, please let me know. And I just, I can't thank Rhonda Kelly and Mind Spa and everyone else who's been so incredible. Uh, it's just been, it's been awesome, man. It's been a wild few months. Sorry to lay all that on you. I feel like you didn't talk at all. It's better that way. It's a better host. <laughs> you have any questions? No. Yeah. No, but I'm just, like I said, surprised. I mean, surprised in that, but also like, oh, yeah, so this is why everybody says they didn't, they didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, I think we all we all hide stuff. Um, I mean, it's just, there's just a lot that I think the job, man, it, it's just like sleep. Like that is my big thing right now, uh, because and and there could be a lot more going on there for me, but it's like I can't stand the person I am the next day after lack of sleep. That that's why I hate getting up for night. It's different. There is a different response to a night call that's bullshit and a night call that like you're doing something, something meaningful, right? When you go to work and you get challenged and you're doing something that feels full of purpose. That's different too. When you feel like you're getting turned into this person when you're off duty 
for nothing other than people abusing the system, you know, I think it, that's a different, it does something different to you, but it's just, you know, the, the sleep and the lack of it compounds, you know, slowly over years. And now it's like to get back on track, I think it takes just as long. That's the frustrating part. It's not like, Oh, just gonna take seven days off and go on vacation and come back. No, it's like, I mean, I've noticed my sleep was in the shitter probably a year ago and I focused on it and it's just like, just, I'm starting to have a little bit better night sleeps now. I'm, I'm, I have dreams more often and, um, I'm waking up a little bit less, you know, I mean, I'm talking like six to eight times a night, easy waking up. And now like I'm maybe two or three. So we have these constants in our job. Lack of sleep being one of them. Uh, seeing trauma is another. And we have home stressors, right? Those are like the trifecta of things that we cannot change. Instead of getting frustrated about that, what other kind of things can we start to mitigate to make that stuff less bad, right? So not drinking. Uh, you know what's interesting is I, um, for no reason, I have no idea why. Like, And I've, I've done this throughout my life where, where I'll have a cocktail a night and then sometimes I won't drink for months. And like, I got to think maybe sometime in the spring, maybe, I was maybe beginning of the year, I just was like, no, nah, I'm not craving anymore. So I haven't been drinking either. And that probably has helped. Yeah, right? So yeah. like, I think we need to, uh, I think it's really easy to blame the bullshit. And it stinks, dude. I'm with you. I don't want to do that. But yeah. the people who I see are, are really like every time they get up, they're yelling and screaming and there's something else going on. So like if we 100%. can, yeah, if yeah. we can get our, ourselves right, right. And give ourselves the ability to manage stress better. Everything else gets better. And I'm not saying that this is like, I have no stress anymore. Right. I'm still married and have two kids that are, little toddlers still like there's still plenty of stress but it's a way to manage that and like now I'm really excited to go to work again like I'm excited to give back to the department again I'm excited to go out and teach and do all this other sorts of stuff and I'm more engaged at home I'm a way better dad and husband now it's been a really interesting journey of like looking inward, right? We, we spend so much time like physically being ready for the job and we do nothing to get us mentally ready for the job, right? We go to the resilience stuff where it's like, I'm not saying that those resilience classes of like, and we did one, man, that 24 hour class. Well, but even part of, part of our existing classes, you know, staying in your gear the whole time, pushing through stuff, you know, hard, do hard things. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm all in. I think that stuff's super important. But what are we then we just forget about our brains, right? Like, what are we doing for well, what, that? Well, what's interesting is like you can do years of hard stuff and you can build this bank of mental toughness, which has to be there if you're going to push through stuff. But I think there's a point too where your mind is like, okay, like I've, I've done it. I don't feel like doing it anymore. Like, why? You know, that's. So the mind plays a huge role in it. Your mind oh, still dude. has to tell you, you know, I'm going to do this just because. But you know? I, think the, I think that the narrative that's out there right now is if I get up at 5 a.m., do a cold plunge, run ultra marathons, elk hunt, you know, do all this stuff that that... I'm listening to a lot of Joe Rogan. <laughs> Jocko. But, but no, like, and I do, like, I appreciate that message. But I did those things, and I still got fucked up. So, like, those are awesome tools, right? I love the cold plunge, do it every day. I work out a lot. I eat right. I do, you know, I do the things that the talking heads are telling me to do, and I still got messed up. You know, what's interesting, though, is, like, everything you're talking about that these people are preaching is, like, a huge amount of structure, right? It's important, right? Yeah, it's super important. The one thing 
that's not part of anybody else's structure because these people are super structured is, uh, let's, let's go on two hours of sleep for like four days in a row. Right. I mean, because in order to have this structure that they're talking about and do the stuff and get the effects from it and feel the way you do, like you have to let your body rest. A hundred, you know, a hundred percent agree with you. And I think it just goes to my point that like all of this stuff works together. Don't just think that, oh, I need to go harder. I need to be fat. Like, that is a fool's errand, man. Because when your brain, and you're, more importantly, dude, when your central nervous system tells you that it's time to stop, there's no getting through it. Yeah. I have, I have gone through some really hard physical things. Uh, ultra marathon being one of them a few months prior to this. And it's like, you feel like, man, what else? Like, there's nothing I can't do. That's your brain. That's this little rider on top of the elephant. But when that elephant wants to sit down and not fucking move, spoiler alert, you ain't moving. There's no amount of mental toughness that's going to get you through that. So you need to be able to control the chemicals that your body is releasing if you have any hope of getting through moments like that. Like that month was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I've done some hard shit. And it almost took me out. So you do need all that stuff. But if you can't dial this in, I don't know what you're going to do. Right. When it happens, and maybe it won't ever happen to you, right? Like, I know guys on the job who've like, I've never been depressed. I've never had anxiety. I think those people are pretty rare. And I do thank God for them. I hope they're telling me the truth, you know, but since I've started talking about this, people have come out of the woodwork, top performers, right? They do crazy shit on their off days, right? Total savages. And they're like, I'm having all these problems right now. I think all of this stuff is good, but it's like, I'm a baker, right? Everyone knows it. It's like you're, adding all the fun ingredients and you're not adding the one that's really important, right? Like all the stuff we do, I think is, is awesome. And it's important to make this final product that we want, but like we're forgetting about a really big part of it. Let's take sleep for example. Okay. Let's say that during that month I stopped going to work. I I even talked to my wife about me getting a separate apartment so I could sleep. That's how serious I was because I like when I'm at home, the kids are waking me up. I got a dog's waking me up. Like I can't get a full night's sleep. The reason was is because every time I went to bed, I was having nightmares that were waking me up all night long. So it's like you can't even do the one thing that I know I need. Mm -hmm. And so what do I start doing? Start taking sleeping pills. And it's like sleeping pills make you comatose. They don't give you your REM cycles. That's the key. Like that is the crux of everything is making sure that your brain chemistry is correct. So I'm, I'm with you, man. I, I need all that stuff. You need to have our sleep needs to get better. We, we need to work out. We need to, you know, do all this other sorts of stuff. But if you don't have, if you don't have your brain right, none of that shit's going to matter at some point. 